Okay, well, um, we entitled this uh, talk, Power to the People. It just sounds revolutionary, doesn't it? It just sounds like, and I don't know about you, but as a pastor, sometimes just that power to the people scares you to death, you know, and uh, so I want to, but I want us to think about power to the people, and, uh, and, and Tom has already done a great job of just setting that up. I mean, the, the scriptures uh, teach us uh, about God's power being entrusted or empowered uh, to his people, to the church, and uh, and, and how do we do that? And, and uh, you know, at the fellowship, uh, my, my journey to, and that I'm going to share a little bit today is not about having all the answers because uh, I can't stand up here and tell you um, all the ways that you need to empower your people. Uh, but I want to begin by, by really kind of looking at this idea of empowerment itself. I want to give you a definition, all right? Because I'm always a guy, say, I'm a word guy, so I think about the word empowerment. What exactly does that mean? Well, here's a good definition. I would just encourage you to write this down. It's to authorize another person or a group to have freedom. And this is just a really key word, freedom. How many of your people feel free to act, think, respond, initiate, and make decisions that affect it, uh, their area of given ministry? I mean, do your people really feel that? Or do you find that your people are always coming to you going, uh, pastor, can we do this? Or, you know, uh, is it okay if I do this? Or, I, I really would like to do that, but I'm kind of waiting on my church. Unfortunately, the opposite of, or, you know, of empowerment of, is, is very much about power and control, as uh, Tom said, you know, the command and control model. And if we're not careful, what we create is a real passive people. We, we create a level of passivity in our church where our people just sit and wait for you to program what they need to do. And they're, they don't feel empowered because they don't feel responsible. Who's responsible? Well, you are. Leaders, pastors, you're responsible. You're responsible for evangelism, and you're responsible for discipleship, and you're responsible for worship, and you're responsible for, for the fellowship and the membership, and you're responsible for... You're responsible. They don't think they're responsible. So if they don't feel responsible, they're not going to feel empowered, and they are not then going to act, think, respond initiate or make decisions for areas that they need to be responsible for. So that's just a real key uh, definition for me. Uh, secondly, uh, just thinking about uh, how we do that. Managers empower staff. Leaders uh, empower, uh, you know, uh, leaders empower their leaders. Parents empower their children. Uh, you know, I, I want my, uh, I have three children and two married daughters and one son that just went off to college. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to empower all my children to do were to make good decisions. And I can remember as my children were growing up, I said one of the most important things as a parent that I can do is to teach you to make good decisions. Because when you get older, you will make your decisions and then your decisions will make you. And so if I can teach my kids to make good decisions, and so I, I had a little decision-making matrix, I called it, and, and all my kids can quote it. I, you know, I, they would always, always say, well, is it biblical? Is it ethical? Is it moral? Is it legal? Okay, those were the four big ones. And then I would say, have you prayed about it, right? And they, no matter what decision they made, they, they knew that I had empowered them to take initiative. I had empowered them to, you know, respond to their responsibilities and for them to act on that. But I wanted them to do it within a set of guidelines that were really about making good decisions. And so uh, my son called me from college uh, the other day to show me his newest tattoo. And, uh, and the first thing out of his mouth was, Dad, I want you to know that this is not illegal, immoral, unethical. And I did look at what it says in the Bible about it and the various interpretations of that. I've been praying about it for a good while. And it says he capital letters H-E, with the greater sign, little i. It says, he is greater than I. And dad, it's a constant reminder that I need to crucify my flesh and that God is greater than I am, and I want to live as a servant leader. Well, I couldn't argue with that. <laughs> I, may, I may not put a tattoo on me, but, you know, he, he gets it. He has been empowered to do that. And, and that's the thing. We may not always agree with the decisions that empowered people make, and I'll get to that in a minute, all right? And so... 
uh, pastors empower their congregations. And we empower through th uh, four things, educating, resourcing, evaluating, and guiding. You know, the first one, well, let's say uh, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus gives uh, the source of power. He says, all authority, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. And then he empowers the disciples. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. He's given them a responsibility, and he says that with that responsibility, I'm giving you a power and authority commensurate with that responsibility. You know, if you give people authority, but no responsibility, we call them dictators, right? If you give people all this responsibility, but you do not empower them, you're going to have anarchy. You're going to have revolt, or you're going to have passivity. You're going to have people who just don't do it. They're just not going to do it. You're going to say, that's your responsibility. And often, uh, we are complicit as pastors in the enabling and, uh, passivity of our congregations. We wonder why our people don't do what we ask them to do. It's because they're waiting on us, because they don't feel empowered, because they really don't feel responsible to these things, okay? And Jesus has given those. We often think, well, you know what? Jesus gave that to the church. It's the church's responsibility. Well, who's the church? You know, our people then think the church is an organization, and so they wait for programs, and they wait for things to happen, and they don't see themselves as the church, the body of Christ being empowered to take responsibility and accomplish these things. So, then uh, Paul told Timothy, uh, he said, These things you have heard in me, uh, heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also uh, be qualified to teach others. Again, just empowering people, entrusting something to people. I, Paul says, I've entrusted it to you. Now you entrust other people into other people, empower people. Give other people the capacity to execute on their responsibilities. And so it's four things to think about. First is education. You know that we understand education. We understand teaching. We understand informing. Uh, we understand how to help people um, you know, think about and, and expand their understanding about things. Now, the problem is we often educate with information um, about how to do things, but we don't often educate about why to do things. I mean, what is at the heart? I, I would rather somebody have the wrong methods, but have the right heart and the right passion and understand their responsibility. So that's about educating. It's educating our people around what are their responsibilities in relationship to the gospel, in relationship to the church. They're responsible to use, use their spiritual gifts. They're responsible to share their faith. They're responsible to own their particular sphere of, of influence. They're responsible for their neighbors. They're responsible for things that aren't right in the community, that aren't right uh, around them. They're responsible and if you educate about what they're responsible for, then, and they become motivated, they're responsible for their personal relationship with Christ. They're responsible to open the Word of God, the single most thing that can catalyze your spiritual growth than anything else. They're responsible for prayer. They're responsible for those things. But what we want to do is we want to tell them how to do it. And I'm saying we need to stop telling them how to do it and what to do it and more about why and, 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 and encourage and inspire them and then, watch what God does. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm having to learn a lot is that part of empowerment for me is to learning to trust. Um, first and foremost, to trust God. And, uh, and then to trust people. I love what 1 Corinthians 13.7 says. This is one of the attributes of love. It says, love always trusts. Well, that trust is first and foremost in God and his capacity to work in people's lives. And I think that's one of the things that's really key. Uh, the, the second thing that you'll see up here is around resourcing. And that is that when you educate, then you provide resources. I was talking to one of our pastors uh, in the community just this morning. We were meeting, and, and uh, we were talking about what, what do you give your people that supports them and resources them? And sometimes it's money, and sometimes it's information, and sometimes it's, hey, come in and use the copier. Uh, but, but are you resourcing your people? If you challenge them to listen to God and then to radically obey what God tells them to do, then what do you provide for resources for them to, to help them out? And, and uh, you can't maybe do it for everybody, but we have a philosophy. Do for one what you wish you could do for all. Okay? Do for one what you wish you could do for all. Instead of the church saying, oh, well, we can't do that because if we have to do it for you, then we have to do it for everybody. How many of you have heard that before? 
Okay? I, I throw that, just throw that out the window. Okay? And instead, grasp this idea. Do for one what you wish you could do for all. Because, see, God gives you opportunities. There may be somebody come in with a God idea, and God's challenged you to resource that idea, and you're, immediately you think, oh, well, I've got to be fair. Garbage. You don't have to be fair. Okay? You know, life is not fair. How many of you told your kids that? Okay? I say it all the time. No, do for one what you wish you could do for all. That, that's part of the nature of empowerment, is to say, I want to be there for you. Maybe I can't, but maybe in this moment I can Okay, so uh, another one is around evaluating, and, and that is really helping them know if they are accomplishing what they really are setting out to accomplish. And so a lot around our staff is both helping people, educating them about needs, educating them about opportunities, educating them about how to connect with God, to hear God speak and respond, resource them, say, hey, as God leads you, we'll be there to do everything we can to help you accomplish what God's called you to do, and we'll evaluate. I mean, are we really, is it really worth what you're doing? I mean, if you're just going out, are people coming to faith in Christ? Is the kingdom of God being expanded? Are people really believing that they matter to God? Are you seeing um, things that are out of whack and not working uh, get changed and, and uh, the kingdom of God truly coming? That is the reign and the rule of Christ. And then the last one really is around guiding. And, and here I put guiding there because guiding versus controlling, Okay. I want you to picture a little kid in a bowling lane, bowling alley, and he's rolling the ball down the, the lane. And when you have a kid that's bowling, you generally put up the what? The bumper rails, okay? That keeps the ball from going in the gutter. That's all it does, okay? When they roll the ball, it bounces around, you know, and it looks... And you, and, you know, and it's really sad sometimes as it, the ball meanders down and it hits one pin or five pins, you know. But the general idea is it's just these bumper rails, okay. My role is to keep people from going in the gutter. I just put up bumper rails. I am a guide. I'm a mentor. I am a coach. I am helping people move in the right direction. They may only hit one pin. They may hit ten pin. They may get a strike, Okay. But I don't control the ball. I, I'm, I'm a guide. And so if you think more as, as our churches are helping to guide our people, you know, keeping them on the path. I mean, there's a path. And it's a narrow path, you know, right? And, and keeping them on the path, but less as trying to control and more as trying to guide and keep things going in the, in the right direction. Okay? So um, next is there's some emotions and feelings and things that end up happening. Number one is... This is a mess. How many of you automatically think the word chaos? We're, you're, Jerry, you're saying you're, you're empowering people just to go out and do things in the community and not come back and ask permission? Yes. Uh, you, you mean we're, we're saying we're not going to tell our people, hey, this week we're all going to get together and we're going to go serve in the community and we're going to help in this particular thing. And so therefore, and we're well-intentioned and we do that stuff too, so don't get me wrong, but what ends up happening is we create a passive congregation that waits for us to program it. And we're just sitting there and our congregation's waiting, people are needy, everything else, and but they, what they hear is, hey, in two months our church is doing a big event and we're all going to go out and help somebody. And so they sit there while everybody needs help waiting for the program and the event to happen in which we're all going to go out and help. And that's a great thing that we're doing that, but our people don't feel empowered and responsible to initiate stuff on their own based on what they see around them. And so I want to encourage you to say the chaos is just part of it. But here's one thing I know about chaos. And, and I hear people say, you know, our God is a God of order. Yes, he is, but did you know that God sees order in chaos? The early church was persecuted. They were crucified. They were slaughtered. And I'll guarantee you, the early church thought they were living in total chaos. What did God see? God saw the expansion of the church, expanding kingdoms, going to continents. He saw, God saw order out of chaos. And what you and I think is chaotic and uncontrolled and out there, in reality, is the empowerment of, through the power of the Spirit, the empowering of the church, and God is able then to guide and lead and empower and see. There's so much in the sovereignty of God. There's so much that seems out of control and chaotic that really is part of God's control. 
And am I willing to trust God to work in the midst of chaos? See, most of us, including me, I'm a control freak, so I'm speaking to myself, you know, that, that, that chaos scares us to death. It really does. Just out of control, spontaneous, empowering, setting people loose, it, it can be, feel like a real mess. The other thing is, are we willing to fail? Uh, are we willing to create a culture that says, you have permission to fail? You may get out there and fall flat on your face. You may get out there and have someone that teaches a heresy. You may have someone that goes, man, you know what? I, I care about my people. I'm going to start a Bible study. And they go out and they, they go and they pick a Bible study that's just like really out there and totally wrong. And I mean, it's not, it's not even a Bible study. It's, you know, they're studying some book or something that's totally, and, and they may just fall and, and they get in all kinds of, people are complaining. They're saying, your church is doing that. And, and you go, whoa. You know, and you have to go and say, hey, listen, let's go back. You know, I, I mean, I love your heart. And I'm glad you love these people and everything. But let's go back to what we're trying to accomplish. Let's go back. And then we guide them. And the Bible says you gently restore those that fall. You don't shoot them. You don't beat them up. You don't create a bunch of rules because that's what happens. When chaos happens, when people fall, when people make mistakes, when people are empowered and they really mess up, you know what we do? We go and create rules. Okay, we don't want to have that happen. Let's, let's add rule number 563. Then we'd be like the Pharisees. We create, oh, wait, wait, they picked up the rock. Now we've got to rule the rule. Don't pick up the rock. I never thought about it before. So now that's a rule now added to it. Don't pick up the rock on the Sabbath. And all of a sudden we create rules. Let me say, in empowered organizations, relationships have to be higher value than rules. Okay? Relationships over rules. The more rules you have, the less relationships you need. You ever notice that? <laughs> the more rules you have, the less relationships you need. And I have people all the time, and, and I've got elders at our church, and, and, and every time something goes wrong, I always have someone that says, well, do we have a policy do we have a procedure? Do we have a rule that, so this won't happen again? And we have to go time out. No, we don't. And no, we won't. <laughs> it's a relationship. We have to make sure we have a, a few rules and a lot of relationship. We have a lot of grace. Let's do a better job of our responsibility of guiding and equipping and educating and resourcing. Could we have done a better job to help that person make the kind of decisions that they needed to make at that Bible study? with that group. We take responsibility rather than just creating another rule. We need to give people the freedom to fail and say it's okay and they'll be restored in grace. Uh, the second one is be a permission giving versus a permi permission getting organization. In other words, give people permission up front. This summer we went, we've been spending a whole year in the Gospels. We called it uh, Words of Life. And so this summer we spent the whole summer in the book of John, just studying the book of John. And uh, we said that we're calling it shine, and our whole summer emphasis was we want the body of Christ to shine. And so we just said up front, you, the church, are empowered. You have permission to go out and be salt and light, to look around as you spend time with God, ask God, show me where you want me to, to love people, to care, to reach out, to meet a need. You take responsibility. You are empowered. We'll do everything we can to educate you, support you to equip you, resource, we'll do all of that. Hold you accountable, we'll do all of that stuff. But you're empowered. One day I walk in, and there's a box sitting in our foyer. And it is nicely wrapped, and it has little signs on it, and it's asking people for donations. Walmart cards, supplies, there's a little list there. It's got everything she, that they want. to. And I'm like, as the pastor, I walk and say, who, who put this here? Who asked permission to do, right? That's what we want to do. It's like, where'd this come from? I want to know right now. Is this some person on the street just came in trying to take stuff from our church, huh? What is this? No, I didn't do that. I walked in. You know what this is? This is a teenage girl in our church that decided that because of the Joplin, Missouri tornadoes that went through, she had, she had been praying and God had burdened her heart and laid on her heart that she needed to gather all these resources and that she needed to then mobilize people to take a road trip to Joplin, Missouri 
to go up there to prayer walk the streets, to hand out things, to love on people and do everything they could. And so she mobilized people in our church. She mobilized people in her block. She mobilized people in her school. She got through her relationships. She never, I didn't even know she was doing it. She never told one single pastor, one single person that she was doing this. And so we did a little video about it. Watch this. your mercy I come boldly before your throne and I lift up a holy song the chorus of heaven and I bow down before you now and I throw of Jesus 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 You're the light of every man You're the light of every man know I just found out kind of that she went up and she had all this and, and mobilized uh, most of the people that went up there and that gave weren't even from our church she just mobilized friends and neighbors and family took thousands of dollars worth of Walmart cards and gifts and and we didn't get up and promote it we didn't say oh hey hey church look she's doing this let's all jump in there uh-uh no, she was empowered. She took responsibility. All we did was celebrate it. We just celebrated what she did in responding to what God was doing. And, and see, that leads us to the last one. That's about being mission-driven versus being program-driven. Uh, you know, you need programs. We all have programs, but our programs are really around helping empower people to accomplish the mission of the church. We've defined our mission as loving and leading our community to Christ. And so we're always asking, what are the programs we're doing that are helping our people be empowered to love their community and lead their community to Christ. And, and it's their responsibility to be on mission. And so we're, we're constantly uh, looking at that. And so uh, empowerment, just to remind you again, is to authorize people, uh, another person, a group, to have the freedom to act, think, respond, initiate, and make decisions that affect their area of given responsibility. And what ends up happening is the church looks a little bit more like this. A church full of empowered people. Now, that seems much more chaotic than when we started on the very first slide that had the nice little succinct rows of circles. And that's what an empowered church does, is it embraces the diversity of your body, the many gifts and talents. It trusts the Holy Spirit to work and speak with, uh, you know, to each individual, to, because they're all out there in different places, different relationships, and it's exciting just to see what God does. And to think that there's, our people are out there doing it. They are empowered. And I love just hearing about it. I just love hearing, you did what? That is, and you didn't come and ask permission? <laughs> no. You did, that is awesome. And so I only hope that our church can continue to be a, a church full of and filled with empowered people. So that's it. Tom? Tom? <laughs> 
Jerry, thanks. We'll that stand. was great. Yeah, we'll just stand okay, up and do okay. that. Um, as you were talking, and especially the chaos thing there at the end, it really, the, the image in my mind came of cats and the old herding leadership cats, about yeah, herding yeah, cats. Yeah. All right, so how do you herd them? How do you manage the chaos? I mean, you, you just let it happen, or is, you know, how do you guide? I, oh, that's a... It's a great question. The, the big one is around guiding by um, what we, we call, and, and many of you might understand, the KIs, key indicators. And so we, we look at key indicators of success. And so we're always asking, so what are, what are the KIs? How do you know that you're succeeding at what you're doing? And so just helping them make sure that those key indicators line up with our mission and line up with our vision. And... And, and really just kind of say, well, this is how this keeps us loving and leading our community to Christ. And, and, and just, we, we, we guide it from the bottom, from serving them, and from the bottom up, instead of trying to outside control. Um, we talk about that there are two types of structures. There's an ectoskeleton and an endoskeleton, you know. The ectoskeleton is the crustacean, the crab. It's the structure that always has, to, every time you're growing or changing, you have to shed it, versus the endoskeleton, which is, what you and I have that's supported, that's behind the scenes, and you don't really see it. So I think some of the best guiding structure is stuff you don't see. Mm. It's, it's, it's values that undergird uh, your mission. It's the vision that you're constantly saying, we are, we've got to be radically obedient to God. We've got to be the hands and feet, salt and light. We have to be outside uh, the church, and we just goes guiding values. I think the values, and as well as some of the behind the scenes structure, helps okay, guide. Vision and values help. Vision, yeah, provide some of that guidance. Now, you said you were a control freak. I know a little bit of your story. Yeah, I'm not going to yeah, tell it, yeah. but you said you were a control freak. Yeah. How do you go from control freak to empowering leader? Uh, uh, two things: one, giving up on your spiritual reputation. Um, and I, uh, that's the kind of a word and uh, reputation or kind of expression that I uh, developed was that I just had to not care what people think. Um, that's what I mean by giving up on your spiritual reputation. I, I care what God thinks. I just don't care what you think about me. I care what you think about God. I care what you think about Scripture. I care what you think about your neighbor. But I don't care what you think about me. And, and when I could say... I was more concerned about what God thought of me than what you thought of me. That really kind of mm. separated that control. Because otherwise, control people. If you're, you high control, you're often trying to control things like what people think. Like what they think of you or what they think about the job you're doing or how well you're meeting certain expectations. And, some, and I can't meet expectations. I just People's standards, everybody's got different expectations and different standards. So even in our new members class, when people join our church, I'm just very upfront. I say, I just tell them, I don't care what you think about me. I don't care what you think about my wife. I don't care what you think about my kids or my kid has a tattoo. It doesn't matter. I really don't care. I care what God thinks. And because of that, I can empower you to say, it's more important what God thinks than anything. And, and so that's a big step in my being able to give up control. The other thing is just recognizing I'm not really in control. So. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've typically said control is an illusion. It's an anyway. illusion. It's an yeah. illusion. I learned that from you, Tom. That's right. It's Thank an you. illusion. Good. I feel better about myself now that you said that. That's right. Okay. Uh, it's okay. You're coming along. Yeah. <laughs> is there a downside to this? You mentioned, you know, folks may go off and teach heresy and so forth. Yeah, yeah. You gave us the really great example. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, you know, is there a downside? Um... Yeah, yeah, failure. I mean, you know, people go out, and they, some people are great at starting stuff, and they're lousy at finishing it. You know, and, and we've all had that. Good, well-intentioned people start something, and then it flounders, and it doesn't make it, and it fails, and it doesn't feel good, hmm. you know? And, uh, and you want them to succeed, but the truth is you've got to let them fail. I mean, some of the best successes are born out of failures. And, and, and the truth is some people will start something, and then they move away. And then everybody goes, well, that person was doing that. What are you going to do? We're going we're to do nothing. If God didn't raise up a leader, if God doesn't, if, she, if they haven't equipped somebody else to take the role, then that thing dies. And you go, but that's so good. And you go, well. And, and sometimes you let things die. And even in their death, God births something else, you know. And, and it's just, that's part of the control thing. Because somebody may start something that's really successful. And then leave it. 
And you think, oh, well, well we can't let that happen. That's really been a great mm -hmm. thing. And so now mm -hmm. we've got to, now it becomes a program. Now I got to staff it and volunteer it. And I'm like, no, that's, that, you die okay. real quick. Well, one last question for okay. me, and then we'll open it up from them. All right. You have the advantage of being a church planter. You yeah. started Fellowship of Cinco Ranch. And so you had the opportunity to kind of set that direction. Yeah. I was meeting with the search committee um, uh, in a church. I was helping them kind of formulate what they were going to do. And one of the guys on the search committee said to me, well, Tom, what we're looking for is a pastor with a vision. We're here to carry out his vision. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty common perspective, you know, that we're, we're just here for that. We've, we've been led into passivity. We've got a, one church I went to had a policy and procedures manual. I kid you not, it was a three-inch binder. Yeah, yeah. And they did exactly what you said. Every time there was a problem, they came up with a new policy for new it. Rule, yeah. You know, I, I figured it'd take a year just to read that. <laughs> so... Uh, if you're the pastor of that kind of church, yeah, yeah. how do you lead them from from there to where you are? Well, I, I, in our journey, I started the fellowship at, at, way back, and and I could write a book a thousand ways how not to plant a church, okay? Because I I've made a million mistakes, and the fellowship at Cinco Ranch has a lot of scars, and those scars are because of me. Um, because when I first started, I had one style of leadership, and it was a tell style and so I had people that just said tell me what to do you know what's your vision where are we going kind of thing well the truth is that style of leadership only takes you so far mm. at some point someone steps up and says well you know I see it differently mm -hmm. and then at that point you can squash and say you don't understand but this is the vision of the church this is where we're going that you know and and people will either fall in line with you or they leave well, about two and a half years into my church, I had a lot of people leave. And they decided, well, if Jerry can't embrace other leaders and vision and understand. So what God did was take me through a different a journey of developing a new mental model of vision. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember I was uh, uh, at the Cynical Retreat Center. I was sitting in a room, and I was praying this, and I had my journal. And what I ended up doing was writing. I, I drew a picture of a mountain, okay? Mm -hmm. And... At the very top of the mountain, um, I drew a little stream, just a little trickle. And, um, and then at the very bottom of the mountain, I drew this raging, raging river. Mm. You know, it's a lot like what we saw in the, the uh, Irene, you know. Yeah. You just see these rivers that just are just taking huge boulders and rolling them down. And I asked myself, how does that little trickle become a raging river? You see, a, a trickle at the top of the mountain doesn't become a raging river without one thing, and that is tributaries. Because the little stream left unto itself just dries up. As a matter of fact, there's a big boulder at the top of the stream. When that little, little trickle comes, it has to go around the boulder. You know, It doesn't really have any power. And so one of the things that God began to show me was that the vision that he gives me, I believe that God gives, you know, gives a leader, a servant leader, a senior leader. I believe that God gives them a vision. Yeah. But that vision doesn't have power until other people are empowered to speak into it and to live out of it. And so as people began to speak into it, as I embraced that, all of a sudden this vision began to take on life and it had power and it grew and my little trickle was still inherent. It was part of it. It was in there, but it was so much more. Mm. And I think that was, that was the key for me to say, okay, my, what God has given me cannot, cannot change or lead or overcome or transform without other people being willing to accept responsibility to speak into and live out of that vision. And that's an empowerment piece. Fantastic. It empowers people to do it. Fantastic. So.